Um, okay, so we next move on to our next speaker, um, who is Dr. Caroline Robertson. Uh, she is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at Dartmouth College. Um, and the title for her um, talk is Sensory Processing in Autism, uh, Translational Markers and Circuit Level Insights. Um, so, uh, Caroline, it's all yours. Thank you, Adil. So I'm going to jump right in, starting with a bit of the motivation behind our work. A major limitation in autism research today is the lack of robust nonverbal paradigms that can move across species and afford some meaningful connection between animal and human level findings in this field. Across different species, we currently employ very different measures of autistic traits, ranging from say marble bearing tasks in mice to theory of mind tasks in humans. This of course poses a difficulty for drawing inferences from one level of analysis that might apply to another, both in the context of basic science, as well as for drug development. Sensory paradigms seem to hold a lot of promise for translational research. After all, the circuitry of sensory cortex is relatively well characterized in the human brain. The computations involved in sensory processing are relatively conserved between animals and humans. And finally, sensory symptoms lend themselves to nonverbal assays as they can often be passively measured by evoked responses. So focusing on sensory symptoms might be able to play a big role in autism research, helping us to start to bridge the gap between the detailed models of the autistic brain that we have from animals with studies of human behavior. Now, this seems like a pretty reasonable first thought, but it's based on the assumption that sensory symptoms are, in fact, a core part of the autistic phenotype, which is an assumption that actually hasn't been widely held in the autism field. So starting with the very first reports of this condition in 1943, the sensory symptoms have largely been considered epiphenomenal, secondary consequences to a core deficit in social cognition. So it seems appropriate to ask whether sensory symptoms are in fact core, a core symptom domain in autism. You could imagine that they're not. There are many possible developmental routes to sensory traits. For example, it could be that just a lifetime of reduced social interaction encourages different patterns of sensory seeking or avoidance behaviors of people with autism. Or it could be that sensory symptoms are simply fallouts of disruption in a more centralized process in the brain, like an attention or anxiety, which might modulate sensory signals in the brain, but doesn't necessarily originate in sensory circuitry. In both of these cases, it would be important to understand the sensory symptoms because they affect a person's life, but these symptoms might not give us a handle on translational neural circuitry insights or be promising as early diagnostic tools. On the other hand, if sensory symptoms are in fact primary traits in autism, we'd like to know that they're present in early development as this would suggest that they're not later adaptations to an atypical social environment, but are instead part of the developmental trajectory of autism. Second, is there evidence for a genetic basis of sensory symptoms? And finally, do sensory symptoms arise from disruptions in sensory dedicated regions of the brain, potentially reflecting local changes in the neural circuitry of a dedicated sensory area, which might be able to be modeled in animals? So starting with the first question. In fact, sensory symptoms have been clinically observed in autism as early as six months of age. These symptoms and sensation are predictive of social deficits at that same age, as well as the observed uh, amount of repetitive behaviors. And some studies suggest that they even predict eventual diagnostic status where children with higher sensory traits at 12 months are more likely to go on to receive an autism diagnosis at age three. So we might think that sensory symptoms, if they were empirically measured at this age, rather than just clinically observed here, they might be able to represent good early diagnostic markers of this condition. But are they heritable? Is there evidence for a genetic basis of sensory symptoms? The strongest evidence for a genetic basis of sensory traits to date really comes from mouse models of autism, such as the recent work by Lauren Orifis and David Ginty, which show strong causal evidence between genetic changes that have high penetrance for autism in humans and sensory phenotypes. At the human level, autistic sensory traits show relatively high heritability in twin studies, 
as well as high genetic overlap with social autistic traits in those populations. Again, suggesting potentially a link between these symptom domains, these highly disparate symptom domains. Moreover, family design studies show that the parents and siblings of individuals with autism report higher levels of sensory traits relative to the general population. And this is especially true in families that are thought to have a higher genetic liability for autism because they have multiple individuals on the spectrum. So together, these studies suggest a genetic basis for sensory symptoms in autism, which might even overlap with the social symptoms. Together, this is strong preliminary evidence for sensory symptoms as core phenotypic domains in autism. Turning now to the final question, whether sensory symptoms in autism stem from neural changes in sensory areas of the brain. I'm going to answer this question simply from the perspective of one line of work from my own lab, although there are many other answers out there in the literature at this point. Here in this line of work, we were interested in testing a specific and widely held hypothesis of autistic neurobiology, which is that certain regions of the autistic brain might be marked by a disruption in GABAergic signaling. If this were true, we reasoned that it would likely have dramatic impacts on vision, and especially on visual functions that are known to rely on inhibitory interactions in the brain, such as binocular rivalry. Binocular rivalry is one example of a large class of what we call bistable perceptual phenomena, which are known to tax competitive inhibitory interactions in the cortex. This is because during rivalry, individuals are presented with visual conflict, two different images are shown to their left and right eyes, in this case, a green and a red image. And the interesting thing about rivalry is that due in part to reciprocal inhibition between left and right eye neurons and early visual cortex, you rarely see those two images at the same time. Instead, the brain naturally suppresses one of the two images from awareness in alternation. So I have a little cartoon over here in the left panel trying to illustrate what the experience of rivalry is like as you switch between seeing the left and the right eyes image and a mixture of the two in between. And this here is a compelling recent video of ocular dominance column activity in V1 during rivalry, in which you can clearly see the same coordinated alternating activity between left and right eye ocular dominance columns. So rivalry is clearly a low level visual phenomenon that depends on EI balance and visual cortex. And the basic intuition in autism is simply that if inhibition were weaker in the autistic visual system, rivalry dynamics would be affected. Rivalry would be slower, and the ability to suppress one of the two images from awareness would be weaker. So instead of seeing either the red or the green image, people would see a mixture of the two for longer, with neither of them fully suppressed. And in previous studies from my lab, we in fact observed that binocular rivalry was altered in individuals with autism. Rivalry switch rates are substantially slower, and the depth of perceptual suppression is reduced in adult individuals with autism. These visual effects predicted clinical measures of autistic symptom severity, where individuals with slower rivalry or weaker suppression showed higher levels of autistic symptoms. And using neuroimaging to look at GABA and glutamate levels in the early visual cortex, we were able to identify a link between the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA and reduce perceptual suppression in autism. So these findings suggest a striking difference in binocular rivalry dynamics in autism, which might be a good index of altered inhibition in visual cortex. But so far, what we've had are behavioral observations. Next, what we wanted to know is what this dynamic looked like in the brain. But how might we visualize rivalry dynamics in the brain in humans? To do this, we developed a non-invasive imaging method to measure the rate of rivalry in autism using EEG by frequency tagging the images that are presented to the left and right eyes. So you can see the left image is flickering at 8.5 Hertz and the right at 5.7 Hertz on the screen. So from a single trial, we get data like this. While a subject's perceptual experience is alternating between the left and right eye percepts, so the frequency bands corresponding to the left and right eye images are alternating. You can see they're oscillating in counterphase, the left eye here in red and the right eye here in green. They rise and fall in alternation and coordination with the perceptual report above. 
What I'm going to show you next is individual data. So that was previously just a single trial from one person, but here I'll show you average individual data from two participants, starting with the control individual. And I'm going to plot the response amplitudes for the left and right eye frequency bands, averaged around the time point here when a person said that they switched from the right to the left eye percent. Here you can see that activity in the right eye frequency band is high before the perceptual switch, and it falls as the left eye band rises. The period of this oscillation is quite quick for this individual, seemingly around two seconds from start to finish. Next, I'll show you data from an autistic individual. You can immediately see that the period of this rivalry oscillation is much slower, matching the slower rate of rivalry that was reported behaviorally in perception. And here's the data now shown in a group plot averaging across all of our participants with, who are control individuals in the study. You can see that classic counterphase rivalry oscillation again, and that the period of that oscillation is significantly longer uh, on, on average in individuals with autism, demonstrating a slower rate of binocular rivalry in the autistic brain. One point I'd really like to hit here is that this measure is entirely nonverbal. When we calculate the average oscillation in each individual's EEG signal, and train a linear classifier on all of our individuals' uh, average EEG oscillations and amplitudes, and then test an individual's diagnostic status in a leave one out procedure, we can predict a person's diagnostic status, autism versus control, with 86% accuracy. And I'll just linger here to say, this is pretty surprising for a low level visual task. To be provocative, I'll also say, this level of classification accuracy is actually exactly on par with our current markers of autism in social behavior, such as looking time to the eyes versus mouth regions of a face during a social attention paradigm. But in contrast, this is now a well-modeled task which an animal can do, whether a mouse or a monkey, providing us with a translational marker of autism and visual perception. So in sum, multiple lines of evidence suggest that autism is not simply, as it's often considered, a disorder of the social brain. In fact, sensory symptoms onset early in development, have a genetic basis, have neural roots in sensory dedicated regions of the brain. And moving forward, sensory symptoms seem like a productive tool to shed light on neural alterations in autism. But there's still a lot of work to be done. In particular, it's early days in identifying a battery of tasks that reliably discriminate individuals with autism from controls, it's also important to start trying to move these paradigms across species as they might be hopeful for. And finally, we're really excited about the project of starting to untangle this relationship that keeps popping up between the sensory and higher order symptoms and autism and social cognition, both in terms of their developmental, neural, and genetic origins. So thank you all for listening, and I look forward to your questions. And I especially thank my lab and funders and the individuals who, who participated in our research. Oh, I was on mute. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot, Carolyn. Um, you were actually under 12 minutes, so very well done. Um, yes, so please. Um, uh, you know, ask your questions to Carolyn. So we see one question coming in for you. Um, so there's a question from Angelica Tarek. Um, so maybe I could, if, would you like Angela? Oh, okay. So would you like Angela to be answered, to, 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 to have your question, um, to put your question yourself uh, online? So I can get you up. Just give me a second. Oh, okay. So I can. So she's saying that I can ask. So, um, so she's saying thank you for the interesting talk. Um, how did you assess what the subject perceived, or how did the perceived stimulus look like? That's a great question. Um, so in this study, in this EEG paradigm. We also are recording behavioral report um, from our subjects. So at the same time as, they're, as we're recording these neural oscillations I've been uh, presenting to you, we're also recording uh, button press information continuously. So we've, we've told a person, hold down the left button when you're seeing a green image, hold down the right button when you're seeing a red image, 
and hold down the up button whenever you're seeing a blend of the two. So neither of the two images is fully dominating your perception. And we train them on this behavioral response um, using rivalry simulation uh, 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 display. So we actually present those images and let them alternate on the screen through uh, you know, simulated uh, uh, presentation. And then we um, make sure that they're pressing buttons at the right time and they're able to report what they see. We also use that same um, strategy, these rivalry simulations, to make sure that neural oscillations that are just evoked in the brain aren't different between autists and controls. So we will present an image on the screen that is red for a period of time and then falls away and becomes green. And we'll make sure that the autists and the controls have similar ma matched uh, neural oscillations in, res in response to those um, evoked responses. Um, so those are the basic okay. strategies that we take. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we have another question coming from Kathleen Perrin. Uh, Kathleen, would you like to come online? Like I can give you permission if you would like to answer, uh, to, to ask your question. Um, hi. Um, can hi. Hear? Yeah. hi, thank you, Caroline. Yeah. This is such a great talk and I really like, uh, it's important work and I, I like how you're how are you tackling this? So I was wondering, and maybe, I mean, I'm not an expert in the field, so I was wondering how, you know, primates are obviously good at binocular rivalry, they show the phenomenon, and we have great ways to access reports. Um, how, how, what's the state of, of this in mice? So are- um, Yeah, we, that's a, a great uh, question. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, there are a couple of questions with mice. First of all, we don't know at all that mice will rival given the small binocular overlap zone in, in mice. So we're, we're starting to explore this a little bit, this question a little bit with collaborators right now. But um, regardless of whether they do or not, whether they're the correct species or not to explore this in, this paradigm is now, it's entirely a neural readout, right? So although we are recording button presses from our, our, our human individuals, these rivalry oscillations are um, don't require verbal report to analyze. Um, so the uh, you know, the, the frequencies, average frequencies that I was displaying from our, our participants simply come from taking this ongoing oscillation between the left and right eye frequency bands, computing different scores, doing a Fourier transform, and asking what is the average rate of oscillation in that data. Um, none of that requires, you know, learning, training, or verbal report. Um, it's not dissimilar to, say, um, the video I showed you earlier from the optical imaging study of uh, the macaque um, early uh, you know, V1 uh, um, alternating as, as the monkeys just actually, it's anesthetized in this study and looking at a, at a rivalry display. Right. Yeah, no, and that, that, that's really good. So, I mean, do we know, I mean, again, this is a naive question, maybe, do we know how much, you know, whether mice have enough binocular overlap to even show these fluctuating effects at the neuronal level? Not or yet. There's some, maybe. We want to find <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> Okay. okay, thank you. So thank we you. are to return. Thanks a lot, Catherine. Thank you. And thanks a lot, um, um, Carolyn, for this enjoyable talk. Thanks a lot. Thanks. So we will next move on to Uja Parade.